Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. The wisdom of Rabindranath Tagore. The same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life. And my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading comes from the wisdom of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. The wisdom of the Psalter. God has joined the divine council in the midst of the gods, our God, holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partially to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. We continue in the spirit of prayer. May the divine power within us express through us in beautiful ways. Amen. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. My uh, divinity school is very much present with me today. Uh, justice and compassion and reconciliation, those were values of the education we received uh, at the Episcopal Divinity School. At graduation, uh, that's where I got my uh, uh, doctorate degree. It's where Robert, uh, Reverend Robert Griffin got his master's degree uh, at EDS. Uh, Reverend Ann did a lot of coursework there working on her doctorate degree from uh, Boston University. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, we, we, the EDS is in the room today. The Episcopal Divinity School is in the room today. And uh, it, it, not only where they have certain values, which are really gospel values, um, there was also a print in a side chapel of all the children of the world, all different kinds of children of the world, and so I have a stole that's very similar to that on today. And then when you graduated from the Episcopal Divinity School, you, uh, uh, you were awarded the Philadelphia Cross because the Episcopal Theological School had merged with the Philadelphia Divinity School. Uh, they moved to the Cambridge, Massachusetts campus, but they kept the Philadelphia Cross. So I have, I have my seminary all over me today. <laughs> <laughs> and all around me today, and uh, you're also going to hear it throughout today. The psalm that we heard today, first of all, it's strange to preach on a psalm. I've done it before, uh, but most people don't. But <laughs> hashtag different kind of church. Uh, psalms, 
Psalms are hymns. They, they, it, uh, one rabbi once said, if you considered the rest of the Bible the word of God, you would still have to consider the Psalms the word to God. That uh, they're Psalms, they're prayers, uh, they're cathartic, they're people sort of working it out. And so they're difficult to, to uh, preach on. Except the 82nd Psalm, as strange as it is, is so fitting for the world we find ourselves in this day in particular. And so the psalmist imagines something strange. He imagines God crashing a council of gods meeting. Isn't that fun? And there's sort of this conference of gods, and our God shows up. Now that sounds a little strange, and it is the psalmist's imagination. It's a, the, the Psalter is creative. It, there's songs and poems. And so, yeah, you get to take great license. But this is actually recalling a time when that was actually the dominant view. You see, our theology evolved to where we believed that the God that we recognized was actually the only God. The creator of the universe, the, the, the one God, the, the source and substance of all that is. It's in that God that we all live and move and have our being. But before we understood things that way, we, we understood that everyone had gods. Every culture, every tribe, every empire, every nation, they had their own gods. And our God was the best. Our God can beat up your God. And then that evolved over time to, no, really, our God, there's just one God. And maybe we call that God different names, maybe we understand that God differently, but there's just one God. But there used to be an idea that there was many gods, and so there was this competition of which God would win, and of course, we thought ours would. So the psalmist is hearkening back to that time when our God is the best God, the number one God among all the gods. And so there's this conference of gods, the psalmist is imagining, and the Hebrew God shows up, crashes the party, and really sort of takes over. <laughs> all of you gods, why aren't you doing it this way and that way? You are gods, all of you. <laughs> and yet, real gods behave this way. Now, in this council of gods, this conference of gods that the Hebrew God crashes, I wonder who was there. There were gods uh, in antiquity in the region that would have been known. Uh, and so I'm wondering if the psalmist is picturing some of them particularly. I wonder if maybe Apis was at the conference of gods. Do you remember Apis, the bull god of Egypt? The reason Moses got so upset when, his, when he went away and he came back and his people had built a golden calf. Uh, the people went to Aaron, his brother, and said, we want, you know, we want to make an idol, we want a god. And Aaron said, I don't know, that's, that's kind of against the rules. That's, uh, Moses is not going to like that. And they're like, no, 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 please. We really need something to look at. And, and we just need to put everything in a box. We need to nail it down. And so he said, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll bring me your gold, your jewelry and whatnot. We'll melt it down. We'll make, it, we'll make something. And they made this calf. And then Moses comes down and he's furious. And he says, what is this? And he starts cursing out Aaron. And Aaron says, you know, it's the darnest thing. Everyone just took off their gold jewelry and threw it in the fire and out walked this cow. And, no, that's the story, right? And, and Moses didn't buy it, and he had a big temper tantrum, and you know, lives were lost. It was, it was a big, ugly mess. But why was Moses so angry? Because Apis was the bull god of Egypt. Where did they just leave? What did they just come out of? They left an empire that didn't treat every human being as if they were human. They left an empire that employed the evil practice of slavery. They left an empire that was cruel. And so they had escaped this horrible condition and now people are longing to go back. Go back to the way it was. Go back to the good old days, which of course were not so good. So Apis is the face of being stuck in the past. Uh, Robert and I were in the middle of the state uh, on Thursday. The middle of the state is very different than the southeastern end of the state, if you didn't know. <laughs> And we, for a long while, we were getting more and more uncomfortable with each passing mile. We, for a long time, were behind a pickup truck that had all kinds of stickers that were basically Apis, the bull god of Egypt. <laughs> Wanting to go back to a different time when people knew their place and things were, <laughs> boy, the way Glenn Miller played. They just wanted, <laughs> clearly, to go back. Some people worship Apis, the good old days. 
And I wonder if at this conference maybe there was Ninus, the Assyrian fish god for whom the Assyrian capital Nineveh was named. I bet Ninus was in the psalmist's imagination when he's writing this story, this, this little vignette about this council of gods. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah is supposed to go to Nineveh, the shining city of the Assyrian Empire, but he doesn't want to go into enemy territory. The Assyrians had conquered his people. This, the Assyrians had oppressed his people. He hated the Assyrians. But you know what? Sometimes we're called to deal with Assyria. Sometimes we are called to challenge the empire. Sometimes we are called to heal its victims. Sometimes we are called to negotiate for the release of its captives. Sometimes we are called maybe just to simply tell the empire there is a different and better way to exist in the world. Moses had to confront Egypt. Jesus stood up to Rome. Jonah had had to go to Nineveh, but he tried to get out of the assignment. He was, so he jumps on a boat going in the opposite direction, and there's a storm, and the people on the boat decide he's the reason for the storm, because they had bad theology, and so thinking that the gods are punishing them for having a stowaway, they throw him overboard, and here comes what a fish, swallows him up and takes him to where? Nineveh. That's good writing right there. That a fish takes, takes Jonah to the land where they worship the fish god. And, fr and where he gets spit out, he has to walk to Fish City. A fish takes him to the border where he can walk to Fish City. That's good writing. Ninus then can represent the evils, the atrocities, the cruelty of empire. Some people really admire or benefit from or serve unquestioningly empire, even still. And I wonder if maybe the Greek goddess Nike was there. She was the goddess of winning, winning at all costs, winning even if you have to rig the game, winning no matter who it hurts, winning even when doing so might not be necessary or beneficial, hostile takeovers, needless wars, character assassinations, destroying someone to get your way. Nike, the goddess of winning, was almost certainly at that conference, and she has her admirers still. And Marduk, Marduk was almost certainly there, at that conference of gods, Marduk was the national god of the Babylonian Empire. It's funny how despotic, tyrannical, tyrannical empires have so much in common. And Marduk was the national god of the Babylonian Empire. Nationalism is really what Marduk represents. And nationalism breeds racism and xenophobia and callousness and cruelty and distorted exceptionalism. We're not talking about civic pride and selfless service to one's homeland, but a sinful sense of superiority that demonizes and belittles others' lands and cultures and peoples. Marduk, the god of sinful nationalism, I promise you, was at the conference of petty and lesser gods. But no, who must have shown up at this conference was certainly Moloch, the Canaanite deity whose primary sacrament was cruelty. Moloch required child sacrifices. That is how you worship Moloch, is that you destroyed children. How much fear of Moloch was necessary to make families tolerate that? How much fear was present to desensitize society to where they would just turn a blind eye or even cheer as other people's children were sacrificed. Oh, we still see children being sacrificed today, sacrificed for being gay, sacrificed for being transgender, sacrificed for being refugees, fleeing from lawless gangs or murderous regimes. We see people being, children being sacrificed now, I don't know what anyone's politics are around how children or how the least of these or how marginalized people or how, how, how targeted groups are, are treated in our country and our world. I don't know what your politics are, but let me tell you what my theology is. My theology is that they are each the precious children of God and should be treated as such. Yeah. 
Moloch was the worst of the false gods. And his reign of terror has never really ended. But into this council, this conference of gods, in comes Elohim. Elohim, that's the name for the Hebrew God that the psalmist uses. There are various names for God in Scripture, and they're usually just translated as God or Lord or God Almighty. And so we would know that a lot of different names are actually being used. And so sometimes when you see God, just in all caps, God, that's really Elohim. And so Elohim just crashes the party. And so these petty, lesser, inadequate gods get to hear from Elohim. Some of our ancestors called God Yahweh, but some called God El Shaddai, some called God Adonai, some called God Elohim. Now, so here comes the Hebrew God Elohim, and Elohim means gods, plural, masculine and feminine. And the Hebrew text says that Elohim, our God, joined the council of Elohim, all those gods. Our God joined the council of gods, lesser gods. And when I think of Elohim, that God that encompasses all genders and, and is, is everywhere and, and is, is, is a unity and multiplicity, I think of Elohim as being all in all, plural, all genders, everywhere. And at this imaginary conference of God, the true God Elohim, I like to call her Big Mama God, Big Mama comes in. The all in all, the omnipresence that includes all life. And big mama God, Elohim, the all in all says, all of you Elohim wannabes, let me tell you what Elohim is really all about. Giving justice to the weak and disenfranchised, fighting for the rights of the poor, rescuing the desperate, and protecting them from exploitation and cruelty. That's what Elohim should stand for. And then our Elohim adds, all you lesser gods, nationalism, cruelty to children, winning at all cost, empire, being stuck in the past, your days are numbered. You aren't really real. You aren't uh, anything but manifestations of fear, and fear is driven out by love. People worship you, so yes, you're gods, I guess, <laughs> but you are not God enough. It's just a matter of time until you fall. And then, it's here for the psalmist. He does good work, right? And, and then the psalmist breaks character and stops speaking for God to the lesser gods and starts praying to God, to the all in all, the power and presence of justice love. And the psalmist prays, rise up, Elohim and help us fix the, the mess we've made of things. Rise up and judge the nations, they belong to you. The psalmist says, rise up and help us make right, bring justice, judge, bring justice to this mess. Help us fix this mess. Rise up, Elohim, and help us fix this. In other words, while we worship power and privilege and war and cruelty, will the real Elohim please stand up? Will the God that is unconditional, all-inclusive, everlasting, omnipresent love please be lifted up by those who claim to worship God because we need that better way and we need it now. Any God that doesn't inspire compassion, generosity, goodwill, peace, hope is simply not God enough. Any God that requires cruelty to LGBTQ plus people, that's God is not God enough. Any God that requires you to be cruel to queer people and call it love, that God is not only God enough, that God is insane. And that God's representatives, uh, they need help too. Any God that sanctions apathy toward terrified, incarcerated children, any God that values prophets over people, any God that does not demand compassion for the sick, the poor, and the marginalized, any such petty little God is just not God enough. The real God is all in all, and so it is that all people have innate dignity and worth and sacred value and ought to be treated as if we know that is true. There's an old story about a council of gods having another meeting. 
Now this story comes from the East, from the Hindu tradition. And the gods in this story decide that they need to hide the divine spark from humanity. Because if they find it, they, they'll misuse it. They'll get too full of themselves. It's almost like that magic tree in the garden that we read about in our Bible. You know, if, if they eat this fruit, it'll just, they'll, they'll just be, get full of themselves. They'll be too much. It's better if they don't know. So the, the gods say, let's hide this divine spark so they'll never find it and become godlike. And so one of the gods says, well, you know what? We could put it high on a mountain where they can't reach it. But another god says, no, no, no. Someone is eventually going to climb the mountain and then they'll find it. So another god says, you know what, we could dig a hole, we could bury it really deep in the ground. And someone said, no, eventually they're going to dig around, and they're going to stumble on it. And so another god says, you know what, I've got it. We could bury it deep, put it in something, and put it deep, deep, deep in the sea. They can't breathe underwater. But someone said, no, they're going to learn how to dive, and eventually they're going to discover it. And so finally someone said, I've got it. On the council of gods, someone finally figures it out. I know where we can hide it. Let's hide the divine spark in the human heart where they will never think to look for it. The all in all is in all. All means all. All means me. And all means you. And all means Christians and Jews and Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus. And all means gays and lesbians and bisexuals and pansexuals and asexuals and people who fit in and who are beyond gender binaries. All means all. Let's dare to recognize the divine life within us. Isn't that what the incarnation really is? Isn't that what the Trinity symbolizes? God for us, God with us, God in us. And if God is with and in us, God is with and in everyone, in every community, in every situation, at every border. We will not let people go hungry or be unfairly detained or be denied life-saving medical care or be demonized for who they love or how they pray. We will not allow such injustices to be done, not in the name of Elohim, certainly. We will not allow such cruelty to go unchecked when we remember that all people are filled with the very light and life of God. And all means all. And this is the good news. Amen. Raising spirit 
Fly 